What is the Russian military doing right? This video is going to cover manufacturing, recruitment, fires, electronic warfare, air defense, air power, and information warfare. Now, I have to start by saying that this video no way supports or condones Russia's actions, but I've had a few people reach out to me and ask me what Russia is doing right. And this is the kind of information we need in order to realistically assess an adversary. Wishful thinking does not win wars, nor does anecdotal evidence of rusty weapons or reactive armor filled with packing material. Also note, this video is going to be a little different. I'm not going to make as many cuts as I usually do or show as many graphics or stock footage. I've had a number of people ask me to do more podcast-like content because they like to listen in the car. So if you prefer this format, like my roundup videos where I just talk, or if you don't, let me know in the comments. So let's take a look at what Russia has been doing well in its conflict with Ukraine. To start, you kind of have to understand the operational theory behind the Russian military. Russia believes in an officer-centric military. Now, this has led to the urban legend that Russia does not have NCOs or non-commissioned officers, literally the sergeants like me who do the butt-kicking to get the troops to do what they need to do. This is only partially true. The Russian army does have NCOs, but they're more at the junior level. What Russia doesn't have are the mid-level NCOs, literally the Burger King drive through managers of the army. You know how if the store manager of a Burger King has to leave early for personal reasons, the drive through manager could take over operations and close the store for the night? That's kind of how the U.S. Army NCO works. I retired as an E-7 or a platoon sergeant, and I spent some time as an acting first sergeant. In the American Army, the second lieutenant does the thinking. The platoon sergeant works to get the supplies and the soldiers ready to make the lieutenant's mission happen. The lieutenant is the mommy, the platoon sergeant is the daddy. This mid-level NCO also imparts wisdom and tactical and technical proficiency to their soldiers. NCOs also have a support system of other NCOs they know throughout the battalion or brigade. So if something needs to get done, they kind of work behind the scenes to make it happen. And if the lieutenant gets killed, the platoon sergeant can take over the platoon. And when the platoon sergeant gets killed, one of the senior squad leaders can take over. The Army invested hundreds of hours of schooling and professional development in order to just mint one of me. And you have to go to school every time you get promoted past the rank of E5. But it's not cheap. And that's kind of why Russia doesn't have these mid-level NCOs. It's really expensive to have all this professional development. So... Russia settled on a hybrid system where officers essentially do all of the work, and either conscripts or contract soldiers, kontraktniki, provide the muscle. And the Russian army, if you want to lead, there are ways to further your education and become an officer. If you want to become a technical expert or something like missile repair, there are paths to become a warrant officer. But there's really no track to become that mid-level Burger King drive through manager. While roles like first sergeant or starshina exist on paper, there's really no development path to get there. That being said, usually anything that involves professional officers like air defense, electronic warfare, and mass artillery fires, Russia tends to do well. Anything that involves small units acting independently like in light infantry, Russia doesn't tend to do well at. Now, in the past, Russia solved this problem by just not having light infantry. This is why you see so many BMP armored personnel carriers and artillery heavy battalion tactical groups. The idea is that the artillery pounds the living daylights out of the enemy, and then the BMPs roll in and crush the surviving infantry. Since you're never more than 300 meters away from your BMP, uh, because that's your most casually producing weapon, you don't necessarily need these mid-level NCOs who can think for themselves and direct fires at the squad level. So, the one takeaway from all this is that if it involves professional officers, Russia probably does it well. If it involves professional NCOs, they probably don't do it as well. So let's get started. I have to start with manufacturing. Around last fall or so, analysts started to say that Russia is running out of missiles. And you saw that with the purchase of Iranian drones. Microchip fabrication today is the steel mill of World War II. It can take up to three months to produce a single semiconductor for a missile, whose only purpose in its short and violent life is to travel 10 kilometers from the launch rail of an attack helicopter to an enemy tank. War is wasteful. Western sanctions have had an effect on the Russian acquisition of semiconductors, so Russia has resorted to importing chips illegally from the black market. Hong Kong shell companies to India, India to Russia. Also note that 20% or so of Russian manufacturing jobs are in the defense industry, 
and Russia has substantial stockpiles of Cold War equipment that is being refurbished. Watch Covert Cabal's video on how they're doing that. The link is in the description below. Note that these refurbished vehicles may not have all the electronics they need, such as night vision, laser range finders, and stabilization. The Forgot Weapons Channel also has a great video on how the USA might do the same thing with something as simple as a rifle if there was ever World War III and the United States had to simplify all their equipment to get rifles out to the masses. That video is available below as well. So while Russian manufacturing is definitely feeling the pain of continued demands and sanctions, their industrial base is still continuing to crank out weapons, although lower tech weapons. So that's one thing they're doing right. Recruitment is another thing that Russia is doing right. Now, yes, a good detail of uh, draft age men fled the country, but there's also a population who are joining voluntarily for money to get out of prison or because their friends are doing it. Quick story. My dad joined the Air Force the second he got his draft notice from the Army. He did not want to be an infantryman and die in a rice paddy somewhere. But during the first Gulf War, I remember my dad told me that he would send me to Canada if the war dragged on because I was almost eligible for the draft. And I remember I said to him, well, what if I want to go? And that's probably how Russia is meeting its recruitment numbers. You have guys who are filled with the invincibility of youth and the certainty that it won't be them who dies. There's also recruitment propaganda everywhere. Look at this billboard. This was sent to me by a Russian fan. Funny thing is that women mainly have administrative, nursing, and clerical roles in the Russian army. And most women who join are actually the husbands of Kontrakniki, who become cooks at the base dining facility and so on. But as of now, Russia seems to be meeting their recruitment goal. Next is fires. The traditional Russian battalion tactical group has an incredible amount of artillery. Russia is very good at planning mass fires and getting those rounds on target for preparatory bombardments. Now, since the summer of 2022, the amount of artillery given to battalion tactical groups has been pulled back. And it seems like, like these artillery units were kind of placed in artillery brigades, which can be called upon to support various axes of attack. I think this is most likely the result of HIMAR strikes on ammo dumps. Russia just couldn't keep the battalion tactical group supplied with artillery rounds, so it just became more efficient to consolidate everything so the logistics is simplified and then just slice these guys out as necessary. They've also started using drones with just fire, which is a relatively new development, mainly the Orlan 10, which is at the battalion level, at least in these combined artillery battalions. And Russia has used this to, tactic to great effect when they pummel an area with artillery when they learn of an attack, or... They'll retreat, let the Ukrainians come into their trenches, and then fire on that area that they just abandoned. So Russia has shown the ability to adapt when it comes to artillery. Next is electronic warfare. At the start of the invasion, Russia kind of squandered its electronic warfare assets to the point that the Barakhtar drone was just carving up units. But I would say the Barakhtar really hasn't been seen since maybe June of 2022. Russia is also jamming GPS signals. These are the satellite signals that allow smart bombs and certain kinds of missiles to know where they are. This makes it harder to target facilities with HIMARS and JDAM glide bombs, although both of these weapons have the inertial guidance. Uh, think of inertial guidance as the accelerometer in your phone. So degrading GPS might prevent you from hitting a specific place on a building, but it's not going to help if your target is as large as a warehouse, an ammo dump, or a fuel dump. Also keep in mind, every time you turn that jammer on, you're advertising your location. And just the fact that that jammer is in one place is also advertising the fact that, hey, there's something over here that needs to be protected. So you're making yourself and the surrounding buildings a target when you turn that jammer on. Next is air defense. Russia has had so many different kinds of air defense, it's mind-boggling. Short-range, medium-range, long-range. A lot of this goes back to the Cold War and Russia's technological disadvantage. NATO always had an advantage when it came to miniaturization of electronics, so they could afford to put advanced radars inside fighter jets because they could do computers and miniaturization really well. But for Russia, it was always just cheaper to put all that computing power in a bulky trailer on a SAM site on the ground instead of figuring out how to miniaturize the technology and make it fly. So it seems like Russia does have good systems. Don't forget, it wasn't until fairly recently that Ukraine mostly had Soviet-era book and S-300 systems. Russia knew the capability of those systems, and they chose to stay far away from them because they knew how good Ukrainian SAMs were. After all, they built them. 
So Russia's SAM coverage has prevented Ukraine from using its air force to full effect. No. Right now, the Ukrainian Air Force has the HARM anti-radiation missile, which is designed to go after radar installations. It will make Russian radar coverage less effective, since they'll either have to keep moving the radars or to turn them off until they absolutely need them. Next is air power. This has been kind of weird, because for the first few days of the invasion, Russia suffered horrendous losses and had to restrict themselves to just flying high combat air patrol. This has been pretty effective in reducing what the Ukrainian Air Force can do. Russia mainly uses MiG-31 Fox on interceptors or SU-35 flankers to orbit inside Russia. And when they see a Ukrainian plane, they fire AA-13 Axehead long-range missiles from up to 124 miles away. Also, it seems like Russia's K-54 uh, Alligator attack helicopters are being used very effectively at Ukrainian breach points. These helicopters are firing guided missiles at targets up to 10 kilometers away. There's really no answer to this other than hitting those bases and getting the helicopters out of the equation. The real answer to that is air power, the F-16, which could change the dynamics of the fight, but it might not arrive in time. The final thing that Russia is doing right is offensive information warfare. I've said this before. There's three phases to Russian propaganda, seeding, harvesting, and amplification. Now, what Russia has managed to do is get a lot of people to buy into their narrative for the same reason that the Harry Potter series is so popular. When you're a child, you don't have any agency. You don't even get to decide what goes into your mouth. And I think that's why the Harry Potter series of novels was so successful. It allowed a child to imagine that there is this fantastical world that was full of magic that only they knew about. Only they knew the secret that there were powerful wizards. And this was a very potent fantasy for a child. Now, when you grow up, you realize that there is no secret world. There's the rent, there's bills, there's got to get to the doctor, got to go to the dry cleaner. You get up, you go to work, you go home, you watch the TV, you go to bed, and you do it all again the next day. So when Russian manufactures the secret world full of biological warfare in labs and child organ harvesting rings, you get to feel like a kid again. You get to live that fantasy that there's a truth out there beyond the mainstream media that only you and a few chosen others understand. So Russia has done a great job at crafting this fantasy narrative that has captured the imaginations of a lot of people. And that's pretty much it. Thank goodness the list isn't that long. Again, I am in no way cond condoning Russia's actions. While I am definitely on Ukraine's side in this conflict, I've always been honest about the composition, disposition, and capability of forces. Thank you for watching. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mile shirt because it fires rockets, and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha ha ha, ha you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg, from Facebook, and I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shot. Now, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Oh, no. It is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan McBeth is all the work, yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunker Branding to fund Ryan McBeth to increase your understanding. Oh, yeah!